morning, everyone. Uh, John John Lester has allowed me to preempt him for 30 seconds uh, before his his elegant talk. I, I wanted to just uh, announce to you all that the uh, foundation has put together a real, an elegant summary of the ongoing clinical trials that are uh, we're enrolling patients in. These are mostly industry trials. Um, Melissa Hansen put this nice uh, document together at the, at the suggestion of Dr. Farvar, who said that it would be nice to have a summary in the clinic. We will have these in the clinic. It's organized by section. So for example, electrophysiology, prevention, heart failure, intervention, structural heart disease. So within it is a summary of each of the studies within the, those sections. So, and how to contact the, our staff to uh, allow you to enroll pa your patient with no disruption in your workflow. And um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Melissa and Lisa yeah, for your great work on this. We're going to try and roll these out promptly and then place them in the other clinics, uh, Dinah and Laconia and West Health and Chakopee, et cetera, as we get experience with it. So thank you for your forbearance. John. Hey, good morning. Scott said he was studying his physics today, which is great. And we'll have to ask him to uh, see what we can do here. This is not about that, so don't worry about it. OK, so we've been uh, looking at this FFRCT uh, for about a year. And what I want to do is to show you slides you've probably already seen and completely forgotten. Uh, and I want to do it again because it's really important and trying to get the whole flow in your mind of what is this stuff, how does this make any sense, and then is there some clinical validity to it. So let's go ahead, and I don't have any disclosures, and I want to go back again and to think about why we do what we do. And I think a lot of what we do is very much routine, and, and it's taken on a life of its own, and sometimes good, sometimes bad, but let's go back to the beginning. And in the beginning, which started in 1974, uh, the Big Bang in cardiology, and there was a guy, Lance Gould, and he had an animal model, and they put a, a constrictor on a coronary artery. And by doing so, they then let up the constrictor and saw how much blood flow would occur. The next they would do, they would give papaverin, which would drop all the resistance like you're running uh, in the small vessel. And this would drive the pressure, the aortic pressure would go past the stenosis and go to the blood, go to the myocardium. And what they saw is when there was an epicardial constrictor that got to about 40%, and then further, they actually could limit blood to the heart muscle. And that's where all the basis of a percent stenosis came from. And we use that and use that. And then Carl White, who we know from the university, uh, he's not alive now, unfortunately, in 1984, took patients just prior to bypass surgery. And they put epicardial Doppler on the coronary arteries at the time of bypass surgery. And they, to see is a stenosis that they saw on an invasive angiogram correlate with dropping uh, flow to the heart muscle. And as you see here, the correlation is pretty bad. A and this got to thinking that this percent stenosis model works in a dog when you put a known constriction, but in a human with different kinds of disease in the microvasculature and epicardial vessels, it doesn't work nearly as well. Now let's take this to the more modern time. This was published in 2010. And this took the uh, registry looking at what we do in practice in the United States. This had 663 hospitals with 400,000 patients. 84% had non-invasive testing. And what they found was only 38% had what they were looking for, obstructive disease. And 39% were pristine. If you had a non-invasive test versus no non-invasive test, it was statistically significant but barely different. And then reanalyzing the data to look at which tests were used, here you can see it was almost all spec MPI in the United States. It's not so common in Europe, but in the United States. 
And then there was CTA and stress MR and stress echo and stress testing, which were fairly infrequent. And only CTA got about 70% of the time obstructive coronary disease by invasive angiography. So an anatomic test correlated with an anatomic test. But the other test didn't correlate very well at all. So basically, the standard of how we sort patients is really not very good. It's very inefficient. So let's go back and try to understand what these tests are based on, and then maybe we can use some, some new way of looking at it. So when you have a blocked artery in your coronary artery, and you start to run, and you run full out, you end up creating metabolites. And the metabolites drop resistance in the arterial. And when you drop resistance, you have a higher pressure that now goes to a lower pressure, and blood flows. When blood flows across a stenosis, you get a difference in pressure. The difference in pressure is what we measure when we measure a fractional flow reserve. And if you drop the ratio of the maximum mean aortic pressure and look at the pressure beyond the stenosis, and it's less than 0.75 or less than 0.8, that correlates with single vessel coronary disease and abnormal stress nuclear scans and other ways of trying to look at whether a stenosis could literally limit blood flow. Now let's look in practice. This, was, this is a wonderful slide, and anyone who does invasive angiography should understand this well. And this is a plot of invasive measured FFR, which has become now the gold standard, and I'll show you why, of how we judge in, in humans whether a, a blockage could limit blood flow to the heart. And what you see here is the FFR measured against percent stenosis. And this was done with quantitative coronary angiography, so it's not just your eyeball. And then you look at the coronary artery, and you see there's a huge scattergram. The likelihood you're going to be right by looking at it is a bit of a disaster. And yet, we do that all the time. And if you look at uh, perfusion scanning, because single vessel coronary disease, perfusion scanning in a few people led to the beginnings of FFR, and you look at multi-vessel disease, can you identify any specific lesion that actually limits blood flow to the heart, and you make clinical decisions on that? You have somebody with two-vessel disease, you stent one, you put them for and they have uh, multi-vessel disease remaining due to an MPI septimibi. What are the results? And the results are a bit of a disaster as well, and that's part of what we were seeing on that first two slides. And that the agreement in vessel territory be between invasive FFR and the perfusion defect is very poor, and you underestimate and overestimate as well. So multi-vessel disease, because you're comparing different territories, is also a problem. And this is a meta-analysis of each large group compared to one another. And it, so it's a meta-analysis of a meta-analysis. So it, you have to take this as a grain of salt completely. And they're very different patient groups in each one of these. But what they're trying to do here is to look at, in a large way, what the differences are in the newer techniques, like stress PET and even stress CT, which I'm not talking about today, or stress MR versus stress estimivy and stress echo. And the area under the curve is a way of saying, uh, of averaging uh, sensitivity and specificity and giving you what's a, a good non-invasive test. Uh, and what you see here is that basically the area under the curve for stress MRI, stress PET, even stress CT is significantly better than SPECT and better than ECHO. So we are getting better. All right, so when you think back, now we say, well, what's the best diagnosis that's a, and it's any test, you have to associate it with outcomes. That's what we care about. Someone comes in, you know, the patient doesn't care whether their FFR is. They want to know are they going to get better or not. And are we going to find out about them in the best way? So this needs to lead to a beneficial therapy or avoidance of harm. So what's the data for invasive FFR? And you all know this some, but I want to go over it. Let's go back to the first kind of step to slow down the train on uh, looking at people with chronic coronary disease. And this was the COURAGE trial. And what they did is they did an angiogram to randomize people who were mostly from the VA who had uh, a chronic angina. And what they saw after they ruled out left main lesions is they randomized anatomic uh, lesions 
to either PCI or the optimal medical therapy. And at the end of the day, in about five-year follow-up, uh, there wasn't any difference. If you use FFR, and this is one of the first trials to randomize people in a similar way, and they had multi-vessel disease, they did an FFR of each vessel. And if the FFR uh, was less than 0.8 or less than 0.75, depending upon the study that I'm showing you, they intervened on that site. And they didn't intervene in another site, even if it looked bad, because the FFR wasn't bad. And then they compared FFR-guided PCI versus angiography-guided PCI. In other words, the old way versus the newer way. And found that there were many fewer events in the FFR-guided PCI, which would tell you that this is you're decreasing the number of interventions per patient, and this led to a decreased event, maybe decreasing uh, problems from the study. And this is now a meta-analysis looking at fractional flow reserve, and what it shows you, and I think this is the value of this, is that the worse the fractional flow reserve, the more likely you have a negative outcome. That's, that's the basic. So if you had a 0.75, you would have a better outcome generally than if you had a 0.6 on an FFR. And this is taking everyone and averaging that information together. And when you look at meta-analyses from two of these trials of FFR-guided therapy, there's 20% fewer events versus anatomy and optimal medical therapy and a better anginal release. And this led to this being the gold standard. FAME-2, I think, is a very useful trial. And here, patients who had stable angina with multivessel disease got this way of randomizing. And this was PCI plus optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy. So you could use it kind of a way of doing the COURAGE trial but modernizing it, and now adding in FFR as a way of sorting versus just eyeballing. And when you look at the combined endpoint, it was markedly better for the FFR-guided therapy, and I won't go into this too much, uh, but basically this was uh, all, uh, almost all of the events were emergent intervention required and not infarcts or death. It wasn't powered for that. You look at the cost-effectiveness model, and I know there are a couple of people in this room who look at this much better than I can, uh, but it generally says that there was less angina in people who had the uh, FAME2 uh, FFR-guided therapy. There's less angina, and there was greater patient utility based on the questionnaires that they have that are valid, and this is uh, for 500,000 per quality of life year. It was better to have done the PCI FFR guided therapy. So stress and or anatomic imaging serve as the surrogate for the gold standard. In other words, you're making the assumption that when you have a defect on a stress test, that that represents a decreased coronary flow, and FFR is the marker of that decreased flow. OK, so when you're looking at FFR, how does that relate to uh, quantitative invasive angiography, and how does that relate to an anatomy seen by CT? So we want to see, are these similar techniques, anatomic techniques, that are being measured against, a, measured against an invasive physiologic standard? And you see scattergrams that are very similar to, to the first a large scattergram that I showed you about invasive angiography. CT is very similar and not particularly good. Okay, and then this is a trial we were actually part of, and I, I like this analysis because all of these people had FFR. And what you see here, and this is from the de, de facto trial, is there's quantitative angiography versus CT and against FFR. And basically what it tells you is that CT and invasive angiography were very, very similar in the, in the aggregate against the FFR standard. So why do we want something else? Well, we can see none of these things are very good. So what's the rationale behind trying to add assessment, uh, give a physiologic assessment to anatomy? And that for CT, our biggest problems are with positive predictive value. I see a lesion. I think it's bad. It's not. Okay? And then for, uh, we know that CT and quantitative angiography are highly correlated. But again, they're not that predictive if you just use this as a threshold cutoff of predicting whether a lesion needs to be intervened upon and whether a lesion drops blood flow. We also know that stress-packed uh, 
does not uh, identify uh, ischemic coronary territories and multivessel disease very well. So we might be able to get that information here and that we want to use a technique that will lessen events. And we know that uh, this uh, invasive FFR is better than angio-guided intervention. So we want, uh, this is a way of applying computational fluid dynamics, which are used to understand airplane motion and car motion, and try to understand this in blood flow across coronary arteries. And I'm not going to get into this too much, but to show you what this takes. If you provide the anatomy, which is a coronary CT, it gives you the anatomic model. And from the anatomic model, you have certain things that are in the inlet and then in the outlet. And you make those measurements. And the measurements you need are the mass of the muscle, which is there in the CT, it's acquired. You have the coronary anatomy. And then this, this whole a bunch of things called form function principles, I'll go on to the next slide. That's from the CT. Then it gets, the anatomy gets applied to a supercomputer. And this has millions of nonlinear differential equations across each artery. This is done for each patient. And this creates this 3D model. And you'll see how accurate the model is relative to the anatomy in slides coming up. So you get a standard CT acquisition. We do the same thing we always do. And post-process it. The patient doesn't get any more radiation, contrast, anything. It's just sent to a computer. The post-processing occurs, and you get your information back. So what are these form function relationships? And I think I, I want to concentrate on this a little bit. Just basically we, have, we understand that the mass relates to the shape, anatomy, and physiology. Okay. This is an important point. Uh, coronary flow is proportional to mass. Anyone who's done angiography with aortic stenosis knows the arteries are big, right? And it's because the mass is increased. And so that's part of how this works and how they make their measurements. This is a critical issue to me and that I cannot understand how I can do a static image and understand uh, a, a non-static physiology. And it, it's based on this idea that if you have a stenosis and you're living in the world with a stenosis and you're living in there for four to six weeks, the arteries will remodel. And so when I look at it six weeks later, the arteries are smaller, just like with aortic stenosis. Over time, the artery gets bigger. It's the same idea based on that idea and that the vessel feeding the territory gets ischemic and it decreases in size. That small branches have higher resistance to flow and the resistance to flow is proportional to the number and size of branches. So all of that is measurable on the CT after you give nitro. And we make an assumption that was developed in the lab of Bob Wilson uh, uh, giving intracoronary and intravenous uh, adenosine at the time that you drop resistance by three-fourths, and that's part of the equation. So you would understand that there would be false positives in an FFRCT if there were a problem with the microvasculature, because we're making an assumption when we do the equations that you're going to drop resistance, which increases flow, which causes a change in pressure. And the limitations are some anatomic limitations, potentially. If you give a lousy study, you get a bad result. And you might overestimate the lesion importance because of what I just mentioned. And there is no information. We can't do stents directly, and we can't do graphs. So this is the FFR accuracy trial, NXT. And this was done in intermediate severity lesions. So you're really stressing the technique. These are the people who you care about. If you have a 90% or a 0%, uh, that's really not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out the ones that are not severe. And they, they finally figured out how to do image quality, how, what are the requirements, which are not that difficult. And then after some machine learning was made, this was now applied in this more modern study. And invasive FRR was done on all vessels regardless of the way it looked. And here's the trial. If you use a 50% cutoff, it's not very good CT. It's got very high sensitivity. The specificity, like we talked about, was very low in this trial of intermediate severity lesions. And FFRC, FFRCT was better, but let me move on, because this is what, it, what I think matters. So here, if you have greater than 50% CT, and you have, a normal F, if you have an abnormal FFR, there was, uh, here's a 45% false positive rate. 
and there's a very low false negative rate. If you do add the CT part to it, the false negative rate stays about the same. It's 4%, but the false positive rate drops markedly. And that's, that's the value of, of this. You're, you're having a lesion that you would have called bad before as not significant now. That's the, the general assumption. The same thing happens if you analyze, if you analyze this per vessel. And the area under the curve was very similar to what we saw in the meta-analyses of stress PET uh, and stress MRI. It wasn't perfect, but it's about 0.93 uh, per vessel, which is pretty good. So then this was applied in Europe. And this is a little complex, and I'd like to go over it, and then we'll go over our own data coming up here. And this is called a platform trial. And there were two arms to the platform trial. The first arm is patients had stress testing of various types, and if you want, at some point I have that in here uh, to look at, and they were randomized, they needed a cast, okay? And in that group, either they got an FFR CT guided assessment in addition, or they just had their cast. And then they were followed. And uh, what they saw here, we'll go over in a second, but that's the, that's the invasive randomization. The non-invasive randomization, the patients didn't have a stress test or anything first. Uh, they then got whatever non-invasive test they wanted versus the FFRCT. It turns out that 60% of these are actually CTs. So, it, so you're adding, you're comparing FFRCT to CT and then to uh, stress echo and other kinds of testing. The end point was how many, like we started in the beginning, how many have no flow-limiting lesions? In the planned arm here, the pretest probability, which is very important in the people who were going to cast, was high. Generally, if you're over 30%, that's at least intermediate. Over 15% is uh, low to intermediate. Likelihood you're going to have disease. If we did all high school students, you, your pretest probability is very low. If we did nursing home, it would be very high. So that, that's the idea about understanding your population. In this group, if you had an FFRCT, 61% of the cases were canceled. They didn't get an invasive angiogram because of the FFRCT. There was something about their analysis, stress echo, whatever it was, that, that was saying they needed a cath, and this said they didn't. And at 70% using uh, QCA and 57% didn't need it versus 12, FFRCT said they had a severe lesion, they went to cath, and they didn't. So this was a significant difference. Looking at the, the economic information, fundamentally in the invasive arm, if you avoided CAS, that saved a lot more money, and that was a good thing. And in the non-invasive arm, uh, although the cost was higher because you added the CT, uh, the uh, decreased uh, incidence of uh, angina was better. And then at one year, although the costs were higher with CT, here, at one year, the costs were higher with usual care, even in the non-invasive arm. And then if you look at, in context with the other trials, looking at who had disease, uh, who, who had a very low incidence, or who had uh, the, oh, sorry, oh boy, okay, who had uh, insignificant the cath, it was very low in the platform trial, in our arm and the others, this is what you see from all those other studies. So this is a way to get rid of patients who don't have severe lesions who, and send them the right people to CAS. So what are the problems with using this technique? And that's what this is all about. Uh, what about calcium? Can you read through it? That's a problem when you read CT. And it's very sensitive to the kind of scanner you have and how well you prepare the patient. And there was an uh, insignificant difference per patient and a slightly significant difference per vessel probably makes a difference, not much of a difference. So it's pretty good with high calcium. And then what about the problem that we're measuring it against? This is invasive FFR. And from the DEFER trial, they did two repeat measurements 10 minutes apart. And if, if, you're, if you're outside, if you're 0 0.78, then you're going to have, or rather 0 0.72 or 0 0.89, it's very likely when you remeasure it, you're still going to be either very significant or insignificant. But as you get closer to that cut point of 
all of a sudden just measuring it twice or at a different time, 10 minutes later, will give you 50% uh, one side or the other at 0.8. If that's how you make your decision is 0.81 versus 0.79, uh, it's going to be hard to compare something to that imperfect standard. So every standard is imperfect. So you really you have to use your judgment. But, but understand that all these comparisons are to a kind of a moving target. And then if you repeat FFRCT multiple times, remember it's got a million differential equations for each artery, so that kind of is what you're getting as, a, as an aggregate. Uh, but if you repeat it, you do get a small standard deviation just like you do with the FFR. This was in the NXD trial. They took a number of patients to repeat it. So these are the questions, and now we'll get to our stuff. I, and this is what I, I thought about prior to implementation here. And uh, there is a pressure on CT quality, image quality, and it didn't turn out that much of an issue for us. The turnover time for results are an issue, and most of these patients are a chronic patient, so it's less of an issue. It should be within 24 hours. And how will this reflect study outcomes? How are our outcomes going to matter? Well, our patient population is going to be different than intermediate severity lesion patients from Denmark. And then uh, is this applied to acute lesions? Well, we don't know, so we're going to find out here. And this is, I think, the most important thing, is how do you relate a continuous variable to a binary choice? And that's where clinical judgment comes in, and everyone's judgment's a little different. But remember that the risk linearly, linearly increases with the severity of the FFRCT result. So you're going to make not that many mistakes if it's 0 0.6 versus, uh, versus uh, 0 0.9 uh, relative to 0 0.76 versus 0 0.78. So uh, it's, it's going to matter, but not tremendously, I don't believe. And then the reality is we have this new test. We don't pay any attention to this at all. We, we have all kinds of things that we do, and most, many times we just go back to what we're used to. So that we're going to find out. All right, this is what our experience is. This is a typical thing. This is what we expected the technique to do. Here you see a lesion in the LAD on a CT. It's kind of bright, hard to see through it, okay? You can see on the other side of it, there's some contrast, and Mark knows how to read these, and he knows that he's good with this, but for a lot of people out there, they're not so good with this, and they wouldn't know. This patient had a high calcium score with an atrial fibrillation, and the FFRCT is 0.83 and more, and it's insignificant. So that's what we were expecting. Okay, here's a patient with typical angina. Here's the CT. See the remodeling, severe lesion, severe lesion on cath, severe lesion, the FFR is 0.68. Okay, but did we really need this? You know, most of you could read the CT and, and know that we ought to send this guy to cath. So I would say no. This, the CT helped, but the FFR, it, it just correlated, but, you know, it probably didn't help. On the other hand, by doing this, it doesn't add anything more to the patient as far as exposure. It might add cost at this time, but if we needed physiology for payers, all we do is send it on the Internet and get it analyzed. And it would say, yes, you're right. Because remember, the intended arm for cath, you save a huge amount of money if you look at physiology in general. So we could use it provisionally and decide to apply it if we needed it. Okay, so let's apply it. Here's a patient, uh, people, someone we all know, actually, and uh, recurrent new onset chest pain is in the ER, get the CT the next day. Here's the CT, it's a diagonal branch. Here's the lesion, okay, not too hard. And then here's the FFRCT. So what we learn from this is we know the vessel. We know the size of the vessel. That's a branch, diagonal branch. And we got this from the CT. We didn't need the FFR part, but it's you know, a high-profile person. We're, you know, what should I do? Now I, you add the cross-check and saying, well, we have physiology saying the same thing. Can we give medical therapy to a small branch artery that's causing intermittent uncertain symptoms? Yeah, we could. So this person really doesn't have to go to a cath, uh, and we could do the symptom base. We wouldn't be able to tell otherwise, is this a proximal LAD or not, from our other non-invasive testing. So the anatomy adds value, and this adds security to the anatomy. This is another uh, use of it. 
And here is the patient who, obviously of Kelly's, who had an anomalous uh, right coronary artery. Here's the anomaly. She does a good job drawing the pictures. And then after the cast, the patient has symptoms again. It's four years later. And here's a kink at the site. They didn't, couldn't incorporate it into the sinus. And so here is a reimplantation. Is that significant? This is a young kid. Do we cath him? Do we do a stress nuclear? Will that, is that any good? Do we expose them to that kind of radiation? And so we sent it to FFRCT. It's 0.97, and we're done. Okay. Here's a patient for pre-op uh, for aortic surgery with AI. What we get from a CT is the size of the sinus. We get the size of the ascending aorta. And we have a lesion. Should we do the cath on this guy? We, the CT would just take care of it if we didn't need to. Send it to FFR. It's all fine. We didn't. OK, known coronary disease with a prior distal occlusion. Now, if we did a stress nuclear scan and it were abnormal, in the infralateral wall, is this the marginal branch that's here, or is this the occluded distal circ? I don't think we're that good at deciding which is which. Does that help us? But now by, in, in CT, you're adding calcium probably, known coronary disease. Might be hard to judge differences in stenosis. By adding physiology to the anatomy, you know the area of interest, and you can see what's up, and what we see here is a lesion that I think looks significant, and it occluded CERC, yet the FFRCT says it's OK. And then, fortunately, we have the anatomy from the years before. This is three years before. And Mike's trying to read this really quickly, and good luck. Uh, and what you see here is the occluded CERC. Uh, we have uh, marginal here somewhere, and it doesn't look significant at all. And there's no change. So. That's a way in complex settings where you can actually add value with just a CT, now by adding the FFR. Now we start getting into practice. And we have this information, and how does this information change our behavior? Remember, that was, I think, a fundamental question. And should it? OK, so a Lexus scan system maybe is negative. The patient has continued chest pain, so we do a CT, a very typical application of anatomy. And here is our FFR CT. Okay, here's our CT. So the LAD lesion is very significant. Okay, right there. The circ is fine, and the right looks narrow, but it's insignificant. Right? It has to do with the uh, minimal lesional area and the way the shape of the lesion. So it's recorded as insignificant. So the CT reader gives the result to the non-invasive referring cardiologist. The patient goes for an elective cath, and a PA takes care of the patient. So it's not the same person taking care of the patient and looking at the information. And the interventionalist, uh, uh, how much he knows about the FFRCT is unclear to me, but you know, whatever. So he's doing his thing, and I used to do that, and I understand it. And here's an LAD lesion. OK, that looks very similar, right? Looks pretty bad. That's 0.64. OK, all good. Here's the right lesion. No, this doesn't, it, you know, this is a real person. He's on the table. There's his right lesion. What are you going to do with it? It says the FFRCT was 0.84. And if anything, that will, uh, under, uh, will overestimate the severity. But this is visually driven. Uh, drug looting sent to the LAD and rice. Is that the right thing to do? Is that the wrong thing to do? Don't know. But this was not on guideline-driven therapy. This was experiential uh, approach. Did the FFRCT matter? No. Okay. It just was just patient got the cath, got it sent. OK, this is, there's a different but valid way to assess patients. We know that. But we don't know that we're doing all the right thing. We're just using one technique and applying it. So atypical chest pain two years ago. Stress echo, you know, OK, modest. No symptoms, negative test. Now a new onset intermittent chest pain with exercise. Has a fixed defect on Sestamibi with a normal EF. But intermittent chest pain, new onset, CT is ordered. Here's the CT. There's a left main that I polymetered uh, at 7 millimeters squared. The LAD is modest, not significant visually. And the right coronary has the classic findings of an acute lesion. Okay, And it's subtotal. It has remodeling, low attenuation plaque, which correlates with necrotic material and fatty material. 
in the core. Okay. This is the FFRCT. The FFRCT shows no significant lesion across the left main. The LAD is fine. The right is occluded on this assessment. And we know it's subtotaled uh, by the CTA. Patient goes to cath. There is a lesion in the left main. Okay, right? We knew there was a lesion in the left main. Gets an ultrasound. And the ultrasound, actually, because the bigger the vessel, the closer we're going to get. The smaller the vessel, the more play there will be in anatomy. And that gets that. And then there's the subtotal uh, right. And I can tell you the operator is excellent, and the result is excellent. Okay, uh, there's uh, there's the left main gets a stent, the LED gets two stents, and the right is gorgeous. Okay, what do we do with the left main? Physiology versus IVUS anatomy versus I better fix it. It's complete revascularization was obtained here, and it's gorgeous. Okay, it was visually determined, and were the left main and LED stents really good work? Or is this unnecessary risk? That's what we're dealing with in real practice. I, and I don't have the answers to these things. But now we're applying what we see as uh, kind of a guideline therapy with a new technique versus what we're used to and know how to do. OK, it's also useful as a cross check. If you have a new or a distracted or a weaker CT reader, and I think uh, we're mostly in the middle segment of that, uh, and uh, so here's the CT, and this is the, uh, the right coronary. looks pretty good. There's a lesion in the LAD, but when you look around it, it's not much. And there's another lesion in the LAD, and the read was no significant lesion. Uh, we'll check with FFRCT. And this is the FFRCT. There's the LAD. And there's the LAD on calf, and this was uh, probably 0.7. I don't have that written there. But it was very significant and got a stent appropriately. Okay, elevated calcium, good quality study, no significant stenosis. Urinary sepsis, and this is what we're seeing chronically, elevated troponin, big stress. What we see is diffuse coronary disease. And what you see here is the distal vessel is abnormal, but no proximal lesion is abnormal. And that's very common in this patient group. They don't have obstructive lesions. They have a lot of plaque, and they end up with elevated troponin under stress. And this tells us that no discrete proximal or mid lesion. With a pressure drop, we don't do anything about it. Now, the acute group is a, is a different group in which we haven't studied. Remember, you need to have conditioning to change the size of the vessel to make the judgment. So here's someone who came in with a new onset angina. The CT, the CT is red actually by me, and I read it as severe, and it, you don't have the whole thing. And the FFR CT, I just sent and didn't bother with it because I couldn't turn it around long enough, but I wanted to understand it. And here's the calf, subtotal lesion, severe lesion anyway, uh, gets a stent, and the FFR is 0.83. So there, there's something interesting in there, and remember this should be applied to chronic disease. We are going to be part of an ER rapid trial uh, that's being assembled now, so we'll find out about that. And now there's also the problem of communication with a new technique being applied uh, to our group. And here is a patient relatively early on who got an FFR, and we, this was 0.77 in the distal vessel. And then here's the first marginal, here's the first marginal. And nobody would do an FFR of that thing, right? You'd kill the vessel, and that would be crazy, and you don't want to hurt people. Uh, and uh, they did an FFR of the OM1. And the which was normal, which you can see uh, that's not hard to understand. Uh, and then the patient kept coming back with chest pain, uh, with real typical angina, and is on all kinds of meds. And here's the vessel, and here's the lesion. So uh, it was probably right, but the communication that came through multiple people was that it was normal, what's wrong with the technique. So in this case, nothing wrong with the technique. It's just how do you match up all of these differences? Okay, so I'm walking down the hall relatively recently, and I ordered a coronary CTA and an FFR CT. It said it was 0.71 in the LAD. The invasive FFR was 0.83 to 0.84. What happened? Okay, and that gets to, I think it's very important. Let's go through this. 
New onset chest, I went back to the chart to figure out what, what in the world did happen. New onset chest pressure while sitting. Patient developed diaphoresis. Getting more tired in the past few weeks. Coronary risk factors. Gets a CT. The calcium score is 395. The CT was 1.7 millisieverts, which is two mammograms. Okay? It's not very much. It's living at Denver for three months. Okay? So it's not, not too much. That's not too, too, too risky. Uh, 70 milliliters of contrast, which for normal, normal kidneys is okay, and got nitro. Here is, and the reader here is very good, not me. Uh, and uh, so there's a proximal LAD lesion right here. There's another lesion, not as much. And then there's a diagonal lesion, not as much. Okay, so appropriately, I don't know. If you look at this, I don't know if this is going to limit flow. If you did a cath, you shouldn't know. Even you might think you know, but you shouldn't know that whether it limits flow. Okay, so this is a really good, good one to send. So this is the process. Multiple data sets are sent, so you look at it, it changes a little bit with a little bit different part of the cycle, and we send all of those, and they get analyzed. Uh, they return the next day. The PDF is scanned into the medical record. The CT reader clips the conclusion, and it, the, the company has made an error. And the company uses the longest, the, the worst FFR at the tip of the vessel. It's like it's a proximal LED. It's all the same. Okay? And clips this, and it's 0.71 and the rest is normal. Okay, so, you know, invasive FFR is recommended. Here are the lesions. This is the cat. LAD, diagonal. LAD, you know, that's, you know okay. All right. That's about what the CT showed. You, know, you probably say it's okay, but you, know, you might not. Might not be. Don't know. Here's the FFR. It's done across the right vessel, right? And it's 0.84. It was done twice. And here's the actual FFR CT. And what we have now is you go to the internet from an email and you can click on this diagram any place you want in any vessel. And it gives you the FFR. And so with this tool it said it was 0.8 right across this lesion and 0.8 across the diagonal stenosis. 0.71 was the tip. And this is when you look at this there's a gradation of drop in pressure across this diffusely diseased artery. Okay? And this doesn't feed very much. And we also know empirically that the FFRCT, and we've learned this, is about 0.03 lower than what you measure in the cath lab. So that's another learning that's, that's very useful. So it's 0.83. Okay? And then we know when you're across this one uh, measurement that you're going to have one side of the other. So it's actually quite good, and we uh, completely invalidated the technique and made all the wrong judgments because it was the process issue that, that I think we're learning about. There's another thing to know in the background is that in the DEFER trial, I think, uh, there, it was, there was a 17% number of people who had FFR less than 0 0.8 without a severe lesion. So it's all the diffuse diseases out there, which we've managed to ignore. Because what are you going to do about it anyway? Okay. Now, does this exist in our practice? And this is another one from the FFRCT. Here is the cath. Okay, lumpy, bumpy. Measured it just to be nice because we asked you to. And uh, the FFRCT shows right around here. There's no real definite drop. It's diffuse, and that's and the invasive is 0.8. Okay. And the follow-up, the negative stress test to maybe and the patient still having typical angina. So we didn't find a lesion to go after because there was no discrete area, except there is a new technique that isn't available to us yet. This is called virtual FFRCT, where we can model covering a, a specific lesion, and, and then uh, we can then decide, will that lower flow by changing that lesion without doing anything to the patient? And the correlation was very good in a small study from Korea. So that's coming. OK, so what about our stuff? Well, the initial exclusions were systolic imaging, which changed. We can't do bypasses, and we can't do the artery with a stent, but we can do the remaining arteries. Almost all our data sets were analyzable. We tested a few at the beginning that were nasty to see what they would do, and they rejected them appropriately. OK, so we, we have a selection bias. We sent severe disease 
that are very high likely to pass because we wanted to recheck to see if they really had it. And we wanted to see the other vessels. And so we have a high PCI rate. The tendency for uh, problems in the scan make it harder to read, and those are the ones we want to send. So we have a bias against accuracy. Okay? And then some readers just don't send moderate disease because they're sure they know what they're looking at. Okay? Probably the guy talking to you. So uh, that's a problem. All right, so this is it. There were 389 patients. 253 had either a distal vessel abnormality only or an epicardial lesion. So we're selecting a very high likelihood group. And then about half have an abnormal FFRCT. But a fair number of them, by doing this, we found there was a severe lesion and we didn't send them to CAP. So they had a diagonal lesion, didn't go. They had whatever it was. So in that way, it could be helpful. Uh, and then 32% had, uh, had a CAP in general uh, of the total group. And that 61% had bypass, but if we took out the ones we just misread the data, we didn't know, we, we made a mistake, like looking at 0.71 instead of 0.83, it, that would have been 71% of the total would have been uh, going to cath, I mean, going to PCI or cabbage. And there was this minority of patients, 17%, remember it was 17% in that other trial, who had an abnormal distal vessel only. Now, is this the source of symptoms? We don't have an answer for that yet. We also found of those who we thought were abnormal across a lesion, and it cast didn't look that way, most were false positive. But there were some that were true positive. They didn't look that way, and they actually were a severe lesion. And that a small number of people had anatomy-based PCI, even though the FFR was normal. And there were a few, two false negatives. They were in the setting of an acute lesion that we sent because of the way it looked on CT, not what FFRCT said. And unexpectedly, there were a high number of patients with epicardial lesions we just treated medically. In private practice, that's not a common occurrence, okay? But with us, it is. And uh, if you ha there were a modest number of people, when you have an abnormal epicardial lesion, you'll have abnormal distal vessels as well who had both. So you might stent one and you're still having problems and this could be that. And then there are other things that we're doing with FFRCT. We're doing QA, where we're going to send random, uh, random selection of readers that Mark reads. We'll send a number of those to FFRCT to see if he's right. I mean, is, is he right based on my read of that? No, it's better to have some objective way that's better than that. And so this is a way to, to help your basic technique. There is a newer way of analyzing shear stress, and this may be a way to predict future rupture, and that's got a long way to go. And then I think this might have value that going to the insurance companies or even internally, if we have a provisional way to get an FFRCT across the lesion, then we're operating with physiology and anatomy instead of one or the other, and this might add value. Okay, so generally, we use invasive FFR, and the world does now, and it's associated with event-free survival, and that it's a post-processing technique, it improves the specificity of anatomy alone, and it lowers the insignificant cap rate and lowers cost. And there's a very low false negative rate, although we don't know about acute patients. And this is now a new clinical option in our practice. So thank you, and I want to answer questions. Yes. Thanks, John. That's great. So um, it seems like from a quality control standpoint from your end, it's important to correlate functional information with a particular lesion. And the data that's sent by whoever reads it might, you know, might be confusing. So should there be an overread by one of you guys where you correlate specifically that this FFR relates to a lesion that we saw as opposed to a distal something or that? I mean, it seems like you guys have to put a touch on the FFR as opposed to accept something sent by a company and allow someone like me who knows nothing about it to make excellent judgment. Right, right. So we had about a 15% number of people who went to CAP who never should have gone because of an error in our process. And as a result, sat down with everyone, and we have a new way to do this where you have to go back to this model and put the pin across the lesion, not look where it is at the distal part, and then you give a report after the initial report that says FFRCT pending that the uh, FFR across the LAD lesion is X 
and I recommend medical therapy or doing a, a consider a hard cap, that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, now, has that been fully enacted? I would say no, but uh, it's been better. That was a great talk. Thanks, John. Um, when you talked about the reproducibility and the repeat, was that just sending it to the supercomputer for a, a repeat analysis with all the equations where, you know, boundary conditions could be slightly different, could change that, or was that people that had two scans and that the scans are always analyzed in exactly the same way? It just sounds to me like right. when you have millions of differential equations, small changes in initial conditions could give you different results, and I just wasn't sure what you meant by repeatability. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so you're, you're talking about the FFRCT repeatability, and with that, it was the scan was the same scan, okay, and it was just reanalyzed again. That, in other words, from the beginning of their process, they have the data sets. They put it back into uh, into the way they uh, assess the the boundary conditions. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Now the FFR itself, invasive, was remeasured ten minutes later. Uh, John, thanks for bringing us along. Uh, and you know, when uh, we talk with our colleagues um, uh, around the country, very few of them are using CTAs to begin with, and even smaller number are using CT uh, guys, CTA FFR. The um, and yet, you know, the, what's going to help move, you know, the uh, the boundaries outward? You know, the we have more confidence here than most places do. And most of the big studies that are used to set guidelines seem to bewilderingly support initial uh, nuclear studies as the best uh, uh, option moving forward. Um, I, I, how is this going to evolve? What do you yeah. see happening, John? Yeah. I, OK. I, one, I'm not sure that I agree with the last part of that, but there is, in nuclear medicine, there's a long history with many hundreds of thousands of patients, and uh, that's where a lot of information has been set. When you have a new technique, the bar for entry has really increased. And so a lot of what we do was based on not very good information, uh, and now it's very difficult to get new things in. When you look at the comparison of various kinds of trials, there are always ways of, of reassessing them. But I, I think that this technique is uh, anatomically very, very good in certain patient populations, just like nuclear is. The low to intermediate risk anatomy for CT is very good. Now, these are very good sites who are part of the CT trials. And that the nuclear scans are very good, are good in the higher uh, pretest likelihood patients. And this allows CT to get into the higher risk patients because you are assessing physiology across lesions that have a lot of calcium and they're difficult to read. I, I do think this is progressing. I think that the reason why the uptake on CT has not been as high has to do with reimbursement. I, and, and so as a result, they ha there isn't money to train people. There isn't the, the need and the push and so they remain at a rudimentary level. The other places. I, yeah. John, thanks very much for a great uh, analysis and helping us understand this. I wonder, when you showed that in your initial slides, uh, most of the stress testing in the US, I believe, it was nuclear, nuclear stress testing. And has anyone ever looked at um, exercise versus pharmacologic as it compares to this? your technique, and, and yeah. what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I, there was reanalyzed. I don't remember the exact situation. There's not a lot of difference. There might be a small difference. In this, it wasn't analyzed as to the form of stress. Uh, in Europe, they use much uh, lower uh, amount of nuclear medicine. They, they use very little. And, and they go against other kinds of stress echo and stress testing. But uh, I don't think there was a big difference. So, so you talked about serial lesion, and uh, obviously that's a that that's a, a complicated circumstance. But let's say you had I, I, I'll just take some numbers: some 0.75 lesions in a proximal vessel. 
and then eventually down after the serial lesion do a 0.6. Is there any data if you fix the most proximal one in the bigger part of the vessel that actually you would improve flow through the more distal serial lesion? Yeah, I, it's very likely, but the difference between point, remember it's, it's, a, it's a pressure drop, so you're measuring uh, the mean aortic pressure against the distal pressure. And if you move move it down further and there's no epicardial stenosis, it's very likely that you won't have the pressure drop that you saw previously. The, the issue here is knowing should you, where is the pressure drop when you measure it from here to here. And that's, that's why the virtual assessment has value. Uh, and you can also place your, place your wire, you can re-measure something after you've done the first lesion. Uh, but you change flow because you've just done a, an angioplasty. I hope that answers your question. Well, I mean, I think. I guess what I was asking is yes. that could we get smarter about serial lesions? Yes. Because yes. if you think about it, that, that, would, would, that would move the ball. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, well, you can do it virtually, and it looks like on re-measurement that worked in that small study that I showed you from Korea. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Have a great week. Thank you.